Hi everyone. Hi everyone. So welcome to the Accessing Reputable Legal Support webinar. We're very excited to have you here. And uh, you know, this is a very important webinar that addresses what 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 reputable support is out there in the community and how can you access um, legal support and um, what would be a, a good a good way to approach legal services in your area? So uh, hi everyone, my name is Mayra, um, and as Susan mentioned, this is a very important webinar where we will be giving some resources on how you can protect yourself and your community uh, in the immediate um, time, as well as preparing for, for whatever it is to happen. Yeah, and again, like preparing for legal support is very broad. Uh, like Myra mentions, we're going to be talking about various different topics. I will be covering around how can you prepare yourself even before something um, that's time sensitive happens. But yes, we're very excited to have you here and we will go ahead and just start by introducing ourselves. Like I mentioned, my name is Mayra, Mayra Pelagio, uh, and I'm, I'm currently the Higher Education Fellow here with Immigrants Rising. Uh, but in the past, I worked with the Santa Clara Rapid Response Network, working alongside attorneys and community members uh, to protect the community, doing Know Your Rights presentations, um, doing um, abolish ICE rallies and uh, doing preventative measures as well for deportation defense within the community. Hi everyone and my name is Jesus. I'm part of the Immigrants Rising Legal Services team. I'm the Legal Services Coordinator and a bit background about myself is I have you know particip I was a alum of UC Davis. I was part of the UC Davis School of Law um, uh, immigration law clinic where I did a lot of screening for asylum cases, special immigrant juvenile style, uh, status cases where um, I was just really screening people for potential immigration options and making sure that people followed through with their cases. So um, a lot of my, my, the work that I do stems from just this huge interest in helping the community and letting them know what their options are and uh, you know we come from a place of just thriving and resiliency too. Uh, Alonso, I think you're next. Hi, everybody. This is Alonso Garcia. I am the Special Projects Manager for here at the Foundation for California Community Colleges. Um, and I am focused on support services for undocumented students, um, specifically around accessing immigration legal services. And we'll talk a little bit about the role that the Foundation plays in these services a little bit later on in this slide. Awesome, thank you, Alonso. All right, so basically, what is, this purpose, what is the purpose of this webinar? So again, we'll be talking about different ways that you can reach out to legal support in your area and also like when to, uh, you know, check when is it necessary to reach out to certain types of support, right? So Myra is gonna be talking about know your rights information, and do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I'm going to give a brief presentation about how we can protect our rights uh, and the rights that are most important to us when encountering any immigration um, enforcement. And I'm also going to be touching a little bit about community deportation defense because it is crucial that we know that even when we are in any encounter with ICE, we still have rights, and it's up to us to know how to um, protect them and how to make sure that we're utilizing them. Awesome. Yeah. And then for me, I will be talking about our uh, Immigrants Rising Immigration Legal Intake Service, which is basically an intake service that uh, basically assesses what are your options and it helps you. Uh, again, I'll be talking a little bit more about this, but it's basically a screening service that informs you about what your options are. And so we're going to get. Uh, sorry. And the foundation will be addressing how students at community colleges will be able to access immigration legal services. Awesome. And then lastly, we will, if we have time, we will address any questions that uh, folks ask throughout the webinar. And again, we love answering questions. Feel free to ask questions throughout this webinar. And then if we don't get to them at the end of this webinar, uh, we will be forwarded your questions and we will more than happy, we will be more than happy to answer them. All right, so we are going to move on to protecting our rights. And like I mentioned, it is really important to know that everybody has rights. Uh, we have constitutional rights regardless of immigration status, and it's up to us to know how to utilize them in the case that we encounter any uh, immigration or law enforcement. 
Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the most important amendments or the most important rights when encountering these officers, right? Uh, firstly, it is the Fourth Amendment, which protects people in the U.S. from being searched without a warrant. Again, this is a constitutional right for everyone, and um, this will play an important role in the case that any ICE officers come to your home or to your work or um, they find you in your car. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as the presentation goes on. Um, the Fifth Amendment is also you have the right to remain silent and not say anything that might incriminate you. This is also important because we often see that immigration enforcement targets people based on um, the color of their skin or their accent. So if you say anything, say in a different language, they might use that against you and they might try to incriminate you, right? Just for speaking. So I will speak a little bit more about um, how that plays out uh, and how you can protect your rights. So um, just a quick overview about things that you could do in the case that ICE comes to your home. Um, if you are at home, it is important to not open the door. Um, people should be asking for a warrant and um, they should have a judicial warrant. And in the case that, and what I recommend people to do, even if they do have a warrant, even if they ask people to, if they ask the officer to um, slide the warrant under the door, to not open the door because these warrants are super, like are extremely hard to obtain. So even if they say that they have a warrant, they might not have the, the right one. They might not have your name or the date or your address. And if they do have that warrant, technically they have the right to enter your home in whatever way they can. They might knock down the door, they might break the window, um, but that's only if they have a valid warrant. Oftentimes they're not gonna have one. So even if they do say that they have one, do not open the door. And again, you have the right to remain silent. I will be talking about other resources that you can use, some numbers that you can call in the case that an ICE officer comes to your door. You can call that number and as you're calling, they are telling you what your rights are and what you can do to protect yourself in that situation. Um, if ICE comes to your job, and I think that's a question that a lot of community members have because it is a valid concern that ICE may show up to their job um, unannounced and have somebody be deported. But ICE, if you are found in your job site, ICE can only enter public spaces. That is, if you work at a restaurant, they can only enter the place where the tables are or the bathrooms, but they have no access to the kitchen or behind any officers or any counters unless they're granted permission by the manager or the boss or the person in charge. Um, that is crucial when we talk about mass rates. As we saw earlier in the year, there was a lot of concern that there would be mass rates coming to our job sites and taking people um, by the dozens. But that should not happen. If ICE was to go to a work site, they need what it's called an I-9 audit. And that tells your boss uh, that they will come back and they will check for person's status, right? By law, your boss has to give you at least three days to tell you that I-9 audit is going to happen. And you then have the choice to either go to work or not during that day. So technically, all of these mass rates should not be happening because your boss should tell you if there will be an I-9 audit. Um, if there is still fear, because we do know we have found that ICE would hang out in the parking lot if they know somebody works there, uh, or they would hang out around the area and wait for people to get off work to make a detention. Um, it's important to make a plan with your coworkers and with your manager and your boss if you can, because they do have the power to um, prevent them from entering your job site, right? So it's always important to keep in mind that you can make a plan and you can make preventative measures um, so that there is no, um, no arrests that are unintended. It's important as well if you see eyes in the streets or in your uh, job site to not run because that's the common mistake that people, people would feel threatened and they would run. And when that's the case, uh, they, you are giving them um, probable cause, which is a reason why they would arrest you. So if you keep calm and you um, go through the process without showing any fear, um, that gives them less of a reason why they could arrest you. And we have the graphic on the left uh, from United We Dream that basically states what to do it says, do not open the door if ICE comes to your house. Remain silent, the Fifth Amendment, as I mentioned. Do not sign any documents that are given to you. Um, if you are an observer, if you are seeing somebody 
whose door is being, um, or whose eyes is at their door. You can report and record. You can record, take video, and take uh, notes to use as evidence to help the person who is being persecuted. And we can fight back. Um, we can. We have a lot of ways to advocate for the community and to continue with that activism. Um, other places in which we might encounter ICE or immigration enforcement is if you're found in your car, you still have the Fourth Amendment, right? So they still have to show you a warrant for your arrest with your name, your address, and the time, the date, and sometimes even the officer number, because um, these warrants, as I mentioned, are really tough to get. And sometimes they would specify which officer can um, conduct the arrest. So oftentimes they will not have that. Um, it's really important though, because I sometimes just know where a badge that says I, they will show up as a police. And the difference in these instances is that when the police uh, stops you, they usually um, ask, um, do you know why you're, be why you're being stopped? And they would ask for license and registration, right? Um, in the case that it would be I, so they follow a car, they will not ask you, um, do you know why you're being stopped? They will try to get you to show your ID, uh, or try to get you to show any ident identification. So if you have a suspicion that it is ICE, um, it's important that you um, first act cautiously because we know that law enforcement could be difficult to, to work with. Um, but also you have resources calling um, hot, hotline numbers in which you can help and you can have volunteers help you verify whether or not it's ICE or is the police. Um, so you still have a right to remain in your car and to not be searched without a warrant with a new car. If um, you are found in the street and you see an ICE officer and also a police officer, the only thing that you need to say is, um, officer, am I being detained? And uh, even if they try to get you to talk, even if they're like, oh, we just want to know your name or we just want to know where you're going, um, the only thing that you need to say is, am I being detained? You have the right to not interact with them. And as long as you only ask, am I being detained? Uh, and they give you a whether or not, like yes or no answer, you can either walk away slowly from the situation if you're not being detained, um, and, or if they do say that you are detained, ask to speak to a lawyer and um, always exercise your right to remain silent. Now, um, it's also again very important to walk away slowly, uh, to not run and to not, show, not give them any costs because it will often uh, arrest people for whatever attitude or behaviors they have and then claim that they had reasonable cause. So it's important to remain calm in these situations, but also be assertive of your rights. So vocalize that you know that you have that Fourth Amendment right and vocalize that you know that you have um, the right to remain silent. Oh. All right, so um, as we know, recently we have had a lot of cases in which there's a lot of panic within the community and there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about what is really happening. The uh, people think that there will be mass detentions as the, they sometimes are in different parts of the country. But really the people who are most at risk are people who have been previously detained at the border or who have had been arrested for things, um, like, as I mentioned here, like a DUI. But it's also very important, as I mentioned before, to know that even with these uh, records, we still have rights and we still have the right to fight for, for um, ourselves to stay here. So right now, the people who are being targeted are people who have had any previous encounter with law enforcement or with uh, immigration enforcement. So we have seen people who probably had um, deportation orders from you know, the 80s. Um, or people who have um, had any encounter with, with the police or who have had DUIs. And I mentioned DUIs because oftentimes people think that once they do get their DUI, they do the community service hours and they take the classes and it's erased from the record, but that is not the case. In the case that somebody wants to get rid of the DUI from their record, they have to contact either an attorney or the public defender's office to conduct something that is called the expungement process, which um, will not necessarily completely clear their record, but at least it will give them people a chance to not be um, a target of ICE or a target of immigration enforcement. Um, there are other um, immigration consequences to other criminal charges, but it's really important to contact either an attorney 
or the public defender's office. Um, I work specifically in Santa Clara County, and I know that our public defender's office has a specific contact person who will help uh, community members free of charge to see how that expungement process can work for them. So if you have that option, and if your public defender's office is open to have those free consultations, you should definitely take advantage of it, even if you just wanna see what's in your record. All right, so as I mentioned, um, I work with the Rapid Response Network of Santa Clara County, and it's a network that covers the entirety of the county, including San Jose, uh, Gilroy, Sunnyvale, Milpitas, uh, Mountain View, and we work all across the county to provide immigration services. And what we do, it's a 24-hour hotline that people can call, again, 24 hours, seven days a week, in the case that they see or suspect immigration activity. So say they think that they see eyes in the market or they see them at a parking lot or they see them in their house, they can call even if they're not sure that it's eyes, even if it might be the sheriff or the police. And we have volunteers that will attend the scene and verify whether or not it is eyes. In the case that any immigration enforcement is happening, our volunteers are trained to take notes and videos of what is happening so that we can use that as evidence to fight for the person's case. We provide free attorneys, or attorneys, um, in the case that somebody is detained, so that they can help the person get out of detention as soon as possible. And this is the case for many other hotlines, and I will shortly talk about the rest of the state and how uh, the different areas that are covered by hotlines. Um, so aside from, pro pro from providing free attorney services for persons who are in detention or who were recently detained, we also have a network of family accompaniment. In the case that a loved one is detained or deported, we do provide um, family services in which we help the, the families either economically or help them with, with their children because we know it's a really difficult situation to go through and we wanna make sure that we're there for the community. Um, this hotline was started in 2017 and it's a service for the community um, to protect the community and basically by the community because we do have a lot of volunteers who care for us and who are willing to take their time to, um, to protect our communities from what is happening. And again, just wanna mention that the services vary uh, from region to region depending on the capacity that these hotlines have. And, uh, all right. So um, the hotlines are divided by region, as I mentioned, and in these pictures, you can see the different numbers for the area that you're in. So sometimes it um, varies by county. Sometimes there is two counties that have the hotline, but feel free to call in the case that you do have an emergency, or um, I'm sure that we will be sharing some links and some information about other numbers that you can call uh, to get more information about legal help. So um, again, everybody has rights and it's important to be assertive of our rights and to be aware of all of the rights that we do have. Um, even if a person is detained, we still have rights and we still can fight for our case. Uh, it's important to remember to not sign any documents that are given to us by ICE or by any immigration um, officer and to obtain a copy of notice to appear in the case that people sometimes are detained but they are released because um, it's either a collateral arrest or it's an arrest that shouldn't be happening, always get a notice to appear and reach out to those networks that are willing to help to go to meetings with ICE or to go to any of these um, places where you need to appear. You, you also, um, in the note of not signing any documents, you also have the right to get the documents in a language that you're familiar with. So say uh, Vietnamese is a language that you understand you have the right to be given those papers in uh, Vietnamese, right? Um, your options, if a person again is detained or is um, arrested, you have the option to ask for bail or to ask for a hearing. And sometimes people will get a hearing with, uh, with a judge and the process takes years, takes up to five years. And during the time that your case is being processed, you have the right to remain in the country. So if you're fighting for your case, you at least have those five years to figure out a plan on what to do and to plan with your family on other ways in which you might be able to get any um, 
immigration relief. As uh, Jesus will mention shortly, there are various options and it's important that we are aware of those options so that we can continue to fight for our cases. Um, again, note that even if you're in the deportation procedures, some people can be eligible to cancel their deportation and um, never give up your right for a hearing. We have found that oftentimes ICE tries to force people to sign their own deportation. And even though you are signing this, if you reach out to the Rapid Response Network or to an attorney before you are um, deported, even after signing your deportation, we can make a case or they can make a case that you didn't um, sign your deportation voluntarily. Because again, we know that ICE uses some really brutal tactics to get our community members to be in fear uh, and to terrorize them. So it's important to know that even if we are in these situations, we still have rights and we still have the option to fight for those rights and we have a community and a network that is willing to help in that fight. Um, another thing, if you appear before a judge without an attorney, you have the right to ask for more time to find help or to find one. So there is various resources that we can continue to use and various ways in which we can protect our rights. As I mentioned, if there is ever any time that you encounter um, an immigration enforcement or any officer, excuse me, always be assertive of your rights. We have red cards that um, show what you can say to an officer or you can just give it to an officer for them to understand your rights. But if you can be vocal about what you, um, what you know, that would be much better. You can say, I have the right to remain silent or I have the right to the Fourth Amendment, which prevents you from searching my car or my house without a warrant. So being sure that you are vocalizing that um, will allow them to, to know that you know your rights. All right, so that um, here I have the rapid response network number. And again, you can call anytime. Um, I can go back to those. You can call anytime. Um, to ask for free attorneys uh, in the case that you are in an emergency or to ask for um, any support in going to a court date or any other support that you might need. The services do vary by region, but I am sure that they have some resources to provide to all of their constituents. Um, and just ad continue to advocate for yourself. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is that um, California just passed AB 32 which will be banning any private prisons, which is a huge win for our community. Um, and it will completely get rid of um, prisons or facilities like Adelanto, which is one of the largest detention facilities in the entire country. So there is a win for our community. And we are looking forward to continue to uh, work in the fight. And all of these networks have volunteering opportunities. So if you're interested in volunteering with them, I recommend you um, look on their website and we will provide some of those resources at the end. So you can look on their website and find ways in which you can continue to volunteer um, and help prevent the deportation of our community members. So with that, I will hand it over to Jesus who will be giving more preventative measures. So what I spoke about was more immediate measures. So if you have an emergency, if you're encountering ICE. So it's also important to know how to prepare uh, have a preparedness plan and to assess all your options. So Jesus will be talking a little bit about that uh, and giving us ways in which we can be on the lookout for things we can apply for. Thank you, Myra. So very important information that was shared. And if you feel like a lot of this information is being shared too fast or you didn't really capture a lot of these phone numbers, I do want to say that this information will be shared with you this PowerPoint will be shared with you in a follow-up email along with other resources. So a lot, a lot of the resources that we refer to in this webinar are going to be shared with you as a follow-up email. So don't worry about it. We got you. All right. So for my section, it's around the Immigration Legal Intake Service. And kind of like what um, Myra was mentioning before is this is kind of like a preventative measure in case you really want to get to know like, what are your options, right? Like, if you are undocumented, living in the U.S., and you're wondering what, what, like, what situation is out there for you, or, you know, are there any options for you? Are you going to be undocumented forever, right? So this is a lot of, this is a lot of the questions that the community does have. And I do want to share, like, this is a resource for you all. Um, so please, like, get informed about this. And that's basically what my section of the webinar is going to be about. And then also providing some updates around 
like DACA, like what's up with DACA, um, what is the current status of DACA, and then also I'll be touching upon very briefly uh, a, something that's been called, uh, that's been going around uh, around public charge, so I'll just be briefly talking about it um, just so that a lot of the students uh, in the different campuses are aware of this. All right, so before we begin, I do want to ask a question for our participants around what are some key challenges in legal service opportunities at your school? And if you want to like type those down, uh, it, I'm just curious to, you know, get to know the, the, your campuses and get to know what are some challenges that are going on in your, in your schools. And I'll just give you maybe like a, you know, a minute just to type those down. Awesome. So I see some that are coming in. Um, very interesting. Okay, so I can, I guess as I start seeing some that are coming in, I can just start mentioning some. So I noticed that some were saying that, um, I see, that some folks are, just don't really know where some legal providers are or who to refer to, um, how to refer their students to legal service providers. So that's a, that's a key challenge. Or are there any legal service providers in your area? That's another one. And then I see another one that is, we have no immigration legal service at our college. Very important one too. All right, so let's give this a couple more. Okay, very important questions. And, you know, we'll be talking about these in this webinar. How can we address them? How is a service, you know, a service to you all in your campuses for educators, for students, um, so they can start either referring students to this service or how can students take an action and actually look into this? So very, very good input from uh, our participants very well. Okay, so moving on. So basically, again, like I talked about in the beginning, I really want to give you an overview of what are some most, what are the most common immigration options for undocumented people? And then also get an understanding of what is the value of getting screened, get an immigration screening? You know, what is the value of that? Why is it so important to get screened, especially now? And then lastly, gain some familiarity with the immigration legal intake service. Like, what is it, right? Like, why are you asking me to do this? Or why is it so important? All right, so before we start, I do wanna give you some reminders, and this is for educators and students. This is mainly around, you know, educators and students, you are all trusted people in your community. You know, educators, students look up to you. They, they go to you. So for some students, you might be the first person where they come out as, you know, undocumented. And how, how is it important to, be there as a resource and know what resources are out there for, for the student that does come out to you as undocumented. And for students, you know, you do, you are these leaders in the community, although sometimes you might not notice or you might not realize that you are leaders in your community where well, you are. And it's so important to also just like realize what are some resources that can support you, but also like people in your community once you go back and, and um, you want to help them grow too. And then second, what are some different paths for different statuses? So basically, this is, you might be wondering like, what does this say? So basically different paths for different statuses basically means that, you know, for example, one status, for example, getting a U visa might be different than let's say if you fall in love and you um, were able to get an application um, petition for you through a spouse, through a US citizen spouse that's gonna be very different than let's say if you were to do it through a U visa. The, the path is gonna be very different, the timeliness is gonna be different, all of that. And then three, the immigration status is not always static. So this kind of, go, kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, where, you know, am I gonna be undocumented forever? You know, a lot of us are gonna be asking us that question. Well, um, a lot of this webinar is also going to be focused around, you know, there could be situations that, you know, you might be experiencing in this country or back home in your country of origin 
that could potentially make you eligible for some options. So it's good to get to know these options, especially some of them are time sensitive, which kind of goes into the fourth one, uh, which goes into why it's so important to get screened, especially now. So for example, we have some options and I'll be you know, particularly emphasizing some uh, which are time sensitive and it's so important to get screened now because we do have some situations where folks fill out the service uh, and then, you know, they find out a little bit too late and they could have potentially been eligible for one option, but because they found out too late, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate, but then they wouldn't, they weren't eligible for that option um, because they found out too late. So it, that's why it's so important to get screened right now if you're undocumented living in the US. All right, so very briefly, the Immigration Legal Intake Service is an online form. It's free. So basically you can go to immigrantsrising.org uh, and under our services, under the top tabs, you'll find the Immigration Legal Intake Service. And on that, you'll find the link to, uh, again, this can be shared in your follow-up email that we'll send out to you after this. Uh, but basically you'll find out it's an online service. You'll find the link and it'll direct you to the form, this online form that bas basically um, is, you know, completely free. You can, com you can complete it wherever you are in your computer and even on your phone. It's anonymous. So we don't ask you for your name. All we're interested in is, you know, what are your immigration options? We don't really, we don't ask you for your name. We ask you for a nickname. So you can say something like, hey, my name is Cardi B, Maluma, um, SpongeBob, Harry Potter. We get a lot of those names. We're not, we don't want to ask you for your name. It's completely anonymous. And then lastly, it's confidential. So all the information you share with us, it's only shared within the legal services team. And then I'm part of the legal services team. I'm actually the one that's uh, facilitating the whole workflow of the immigration legal intake service. I'll call it ILIS for, for this webinar after you know what it is. So ILIS stands for immigration legal intake service. Um, so I'm the one that's basically facilitating everything and making sure members of our team are getting assigned cases. Uh, but we have a team of uh, four fellows who are also undocumented. And, you know, I think that there comes a lot of strength with that too. So this service is for undocumented people by undocumented people. So there, there comes a lot of like strength and resiliency from that. Um, and then it's supervised by, by an immigration attorney uh, and I'm a, a partial Department of Justice accredited representative. So all this information is not shared outside of the legal services team. It's completely confidential. All right. So you might be wondering, so how does it work? So we, are, we ask you in the Immigration Legal Intake Service, uh, you know, questions around your immigration background, such as how did you arrive to the country? You know, did you arrive through a U visa? Or, you know, did, did you arrive like without inspection? You know, did an officer see you at any point? Or, you know, we also ask you like, when did you come? You know, what, what date was it? And all these pieces are very crucial because it also helps us assess whether you need to go back to your country and do consular processing, if you are to get a green card in the future, et cetera. So there's just, you know, a lot of different pieces and why, that's why it's so important to be as honest as possible when filling out this, these responses. All right, and then the next piece is, how long does it take to complete? So it takes between 10 to 30 minutes, depending on how complicated your case is. So for example, generally we have people that fill it out for 20 minutes, um, you know, and then we have people that fill it out for 45. So it really depends on how complicated, you know, if you have a criminal background or if you have like specific questions you want us to answer, we do have a question section in the Immigration Legal Intake Service. So that's, that's just, you know, it really depends on uh, every case. And if you look on the top of the slide, we do add the, the link but then again, this slide is going to be shared with you after, but that's the link to the service too. If you don't, if you want to just go directly to the form instead of visiting us at the Immigrants Rising page. So now I'm going to go over what is ILIS not? So what is it not? So you were hearing about getting informed about your possible immigration options. Well, this is actually not a, a place for legal advice. So if you really want to know like, you know, oh, can I get some feedback on my 
I-90 form or, you know, can, can you help me with my application? Like that's not, uh, we don't provide legal advice. I think that's more space for an attorney. Uh, but part of the immigration legal intake service is that we want you to go to an attorney. Uh, we provide you with a summary of possible immigration options after you get a response. Uh, we provide you a summary and then our hope is, our expectation is that you take it to an attorney and they're able to see, they're like, okay, it looks like you're eligible for all these things. Now let's follow up with all your options, right? So this is not a place for legal, legal advice. This is for a, a place for legal information where we inform you about your options. All right, so two, this is, a, a plat this is not a platform for inquiry. So let's say, what if you're asking about financial aid? Um, you know, questions that could generally be answered through email. I think it's faster if you get, you know, this, you know, these questions answered through email, since our service does take between two to four weeks because it goes through various filters. Our fellows do come up with like a week of coming up with responses and then it goes through the attorney and then it goes back to the, the fellows because we take really good care in giving you the most information, the most um, accurate information possible. So it does go through various filters and that's why it takes a little longer. That's why it's easier to get these questions answered through email. And I'll be sharing my email at the end too. All right, and then the other one is, you know, going hand in hand with what Myra was saying before me. And, you know, this is, you know, if you do have a pending uh, deportation case or if you are currently in, you know, deportation proceedings, then this might not be the best service for you um, since, you know, one, we're, we're not very time sensitive. You know, we, we don't answer, we don't give you a response like right away um, because again, it goes through various filters. Um, and then two, what if you're already seeing an attorney, then, you know, the purpose of this form, the immigration legal intake service is to get some knowledge of what your possible immigration options are. But then if you're already seeing an attorney, then it, it, I think, you know, they're already able to tell you what your options are. Um, because the whole, the overall purpose of this service is to also go to an attorney and then with your summary and let them know what your option, like, let them know, okay, this is what it is. And this is what I need to work on in, in terms of my possible immigration options. All right. So then the last, the other uh, pieces are someone who is already seeing an attorney. I already talked about that. The last two are presentation requests. So if you do have any presentation requests, um, this is not a, a, a space for that either. And then lastly, the service is a, in language other than English. So this is a very uh, commonly asked question if our service is offered in you know, other languages besides English. Unfortunately, at the moment, we are not providing the service in other languages. We do have a note in the, in the summary that we provide. If you're a Spanish speaker, we do have a note saying like, you know, we provided this response in English, but if you want to follow up about, you know, this summary, then you can call this number and we can follow up and we can summarize this, uh, you know, this response that we gave you in Spanish. So we do have someone that's able to provide that support um, via phone call and we provide that in the, in the summary. All right, so what happens next? I already talked about some of these pieces. So you do hear back between two to four weeks, again, because of the various filters. And then our hope is that, you know, after that, when you do get a response of, you know, a summary of your possible immigration options, then our hope is that you go to an attorney and you follow through with, with, with those options, right? And then we also give you like links of where you can find attorneys in your area. So that kind of goes into accessing reputable legal support. So we do provide you links, for example, and we'll be sharing at the end of this, this PowerPoint, just which, where you can find those. But, you know, one of them is uh, www.immigrationlawhelp.org. And that one's an amazing resource where you can literally put your zip code in it. And then it, it gives you a list of uh, nonprofits in your area. And then it gives you like areas of, of areas where they can support you. Right, so it gives you like, oh, you know, family-based petitions, which means, you know, family in, you know, family can petition an application for you to get a green card, right? And then there's like DACA support, et cetera. So it gives you like areas and then how to contact them as well as their website. 
And then if, again, if you have any questions about any of these things or, you know, situations that you might be having uh, and you need legal information, I'm more than happy to answer these questions through legal intake at immigrantsrising.org. So very briefly, some common legal immigration options for undocumented young people are, and then let me see. So the bigger ones that I wanna talk about are family-based petitions. So family-based petitions are related to, this, is, this deals with more like people that are related, like in your family, it's more relationship-based. So for example, you know, you might have a mom that has a green card or you might have a dad that is a US citizen or et cetera. You might, have, you might be married to someone that's a US citizen, all those things. So it's more relationship based. And then employment based petitions, that one's more related to what skill sets do you bring to the country? You know, are, do you have a PhD or, you know, are you working in like the science, technology, engineering and mathematics field? something like that, and whether an employer can petition for you to get a green card. So we screen for those. Those are kind of like the bigger pieces. And then we also screen for humanitarian-based uh, options. So uh, some of these are asylum, you know, Violence Against Women Act, etc. And then lastly, we screen for some options that are not necessary. These are not, you know, permanent solutions. These are Band-Aid solutions. So these Basically, you know, these can give you temporary support, but they, they're not a pathway to a green card. So for example, DACA and TPS. And I'll be talking about some of these. So three that I wanna highlight are asylum, special immigrant juvenile status, and DACA. So those three I wanna just highlight for this webinar. But asylum is super time sensitive because let's say, what if you came to the country last year and you know, the, the, the faster you're able to uh, get an application for asylum, the better. Because if you look at the slide, you know, it says under deadline, you have a one year filing deadline um, to file for asylum. And if you don't file within that one year, then you would have to prove extraordinary circumstance. And what that basically means is you have to prove like, what was an extraordinary circumstance that kind of prevented you from filing within that one year? For some people, it could be, you know, finance, financial, you know, I didn't have the money to go see an attorney, etc. So there's many reasons, but you do have to, you know, prove a lot more after that one year. That's why the sooner we get screened, we screen someone for asylum, the better. Um, so let's see, let's go to the other one. Special immigrant juvenile status. So this one is basically if either of your parents have been abandoned, abused, or neglected by, by uh, no, by, if you have been abandoned, abused, or neglected by either of your parents. And for example, the deadline to file for this in California is if you're under 21. And then in all other states, for example, generally in other states, it's under 18. That's why we get some situations where folks, you know, they fill out this form, the Immigration Legal Intake Service, and they don't, they, they find out that they might be eligible for this option when they're 25. And, you know, it's very unfortunate because, you know, they could have had a pathway to a green card because of this, you know, very unfortunate circumstance, but because they found out about it later, they, they, you know, unfortunately they, they aged out of this eligibility. So that's why it's so important to get to know these options right away. All right, and then the other one that I do want to highlight very briefly is, um, so, you know, people whose DACA expired on or after September 5th, 2016, you can submit a DACA renewal application, so as a renewal application, but if it expired before September 5th, 2016, then, we, then you will have to submit an, uh, an application as an initial, as a first time application, right? Um, but then folks might be wondering, like, what's up with DACA right now um, in terms of like the court cases and all of that. So generally, what I want to just say is um, in next month, actually, in November, the Supreme Court will be hearing um, arguments for and against DACA. And then they will come up with a decision between January through June of, of next year. So stay tuned. And, you know, Immigrants Rising will, you know, as soon as we hear something from the Supreme Court or, you know, we'll just keep, we'll keep you updated on, on any decision that's, that's made around DACA.
And oh, sorry, I forgot to say, and then no initial applications are being accepted um, for DACA at this moment. So that's very important too. So lastly, I do wanna talk about public charge. And um, what I wanna talk about in public charge is, you know, you might be wondering what is public charge? So public charge is basically very briefly, um, it's when the, the government de determines you to be inadmissible if you're applying for like a green card. Um, if let's say for some reason through cash assistance, long-term care, et cetera, you're determined to be dependent on the state um, based on different criteria. But basically what I wanna talk about in this and I really wanna emphasize is, so today was supposed to be a big day around public the public charge rule that was um, through Trump. And basically a decision was made, I believe around yesterday, uh, where three different judges from different states, so California, New York, and Washington, um, you know, federal judges, they issued preliminary injunctions to block this rule from happening today. So there's a lot of states that are right now, um, you know, going around and really issuing these court cases, blocking this rule from happening, but it's important to know what it is and um, to get informed. And I do want to say also for students out there that, you know, this is not retroactive. So let's say whenever this rule happens, um, if, you, if you have used assistance in the past and it does satisfy some of these public charge criteria, then it doesn't affect, it, it, it shouldn't, it would not affect you if you have used it in the past. Um, it's only if you will use it once the, the rule happens on forward. And you know, you might be wondering if I am a student and I'm using financial aid, so for financial aid purposes, you know, public charge does not, it's not one of the criteria. So you shouldn't be worried about that either. And then next steps. So basically some of the next steps after this is I hope that you fill out the immigration legal intake service. If this is calling you out, you're like, this is for me. And then we will send out a follow up around the what is illis. So basically FAQs. And then another one, which is accessing, you know, getting legal help, uh, a resource that Immigrants Rising created on how to know when an when a attorney is reputable or not and how to go about it, right? And how to find that. And that's where we include some of these links also on, you know, putting in your zip code and how can you find an immigration attorney at your area. All right. And then this is just, again, this, PowerPoint is going to be shared with you all at the end. So this is just a testimony from someone that has used the Immigration Legal Intake Service and now they're, you know, they're, they're continuing to thrive um, as an attorney. So now I will transition over to Alonso, who will be talking about the Immigration Legal Services funding uh, for, for some community colleges. So I will just go ahead and transition it over to him. And yeah, I, I hope that you all found my section interesting and, and it was calling out some of you to, to fill it out. So thank you again. And now I will transition it over to Alonso. Thank you, Jesus, for that um, introduction. I would like to backtrack a little bit on back on public charge and um, remind our viewers that the Foundation for California Community Colleges in partnership with Department of Social Services will be putting on a webinar around public charge on October 28th um, at two o'clock. And the webinar will be recorded and accessible to all of you um, as well as your peers. Um, so please be, um, the foundation will be sending out information in the next couple of days around this webinar and um, hopefully we can get um, some great engagement. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the Foundation for California Community Colleges is the official auxiliary of the Ch California Community College Chancellor's Office um, and in partnership with the Department of Social Services will be implementing immigration legal services um, to the community colleges um, and some of the funding that we received was appropriated back in 2018 um, through Assembly Bill 1809, um, which granted the community college system around $10 million to provide immigration legal services 
um, to the community college system and those services are accessible to students, faculty, and staff. Um, and our attorneys will be able to assist with um, change of status, screenings, as Jesus has talked about. Um, we will also be able to ask any questions and um, all of these services are free so long as you are a student of the community college system. Um, and given that the community colleges in California, there's around 115 of them, um, with through our partnership, we have decided to create host campuses or host colleges um, that will be identified in the, in the, throughout the state that will host these attorneys on their campuses one to multiple times a week. Um, and those guide, guidelines will be posted to, um, by each college in the next few months as we finalize the number of colleges that will be participating in this initial pilot phase. Um, so if the college that you are attending uh, does not, will not be one of our host campuses, don't worry, you will be able to access these services at any nearby college so long as you provide a valid um, student email address that ends in edu. Um, and you will not be asked to provide any uh, identifying information ahead of time, you will, that will just be determined by, between you and the attorney at the time of your appointment. Um, and if you do have any questions around how to access these services, please feel free to reach out to me directly um, at, um, and I think my contact information is towards the end of the slides, um, but it's A.L. Garcia at foundationccc.org and I'll trans, um, give it back to Jesus to wrap up our webinar for the day. Thank you Alonso uh, for sharing some very exciting work that's happening um, and again I'm gonna go back some slides okay so we did share some resources uh, Myra and I uh, around you know what it, you know how can you go to the immigration legal intake service what is the link for that Immigration Advocates Network, United We Dream, you know, what to do if ICE comes to your door, all these different amazing resources that are, that are out there for you, for you as a resource on how you can, you know, take action um, and get informed as well. So again, this PowerPoint is going to be shared with you all, uh, along with some of these links um, in, in a follow-up email. And I do want to say that if you do have any follow-up questions around any of the information that was shared around today, this is where you know our emails are included on this PowerPoint. So for example, mine, you can contact me at legalintake at immigrantsrising.org. Yeah, and you can contact me at mpelagio at immigrantsrising.org. Yeah, and we're very excited uh, about this whole Undocu Week initiative. And I just wanna share, keep thriving, keep being resilient, uh, and, you know, I'm undocumented as well. I'm applying to law schools and, you know, we're here and we're doing amazing stuff. So keep getting informed, keep helping your community um, as well. And we're here for you too. So have an amazing week, everyone. And thanks again for just, you know, being here today. Yeah. And we will be opening it up for questions. Um, there is a question around immigration legal intake services available to anyone or is it restricted to CCC students? That's um, a great question. Yeah, thank you Alonso for bringing that up. So uh, the immigration legal intake service, um, as I said in some of the previous slides, it's not only open to CCC students, um, it's open to anyone in the community. So it's undocumented young people. And again, a lot of people can interpret young um, however way they want. People are young at heart. So again, the service is not only for CCC students. It's open to anyone that's undocumented living in the U.S. And uh, in regards to the immigration legal services that I was discussing, you do have to be a community college student in order to access these services. They will, they are at this point not available to those in our communities um, as of yet. Um, there is also another question around when decisions will be made about the 
host colleges and um, our partners at Department of Social Services and the Chancellor's Office uh, have finalized those, our recommendations and um, those at the college level will be notified within the next couple of weeks. Um, and we hope to have these services started on our campuses um, in the early part of next year. Yeah, and I do want to add, if you have any questions about the public charge rule um, and all the cases that have been happening around that too, um, like Alonso said, I want to emphasize there is going to be another webinar on October 28th at 2 p.m. Um, where the ILRC will be hosting it. So uh, stay tuned. There's also some resources in our resource slide about public charge. Do we have any other questions coming in? And if we don't have any at the moment, then again, you can all feel free to ask any questions. Um, you have our email addresses and we would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you all for tuning in. All right, we still have four minutes, so we can just sit around and um, just wait for any questions that come in. Yeah. I would definitely encourage everybody to check out the resource slide because we have some information on the red cards and what to say if you encounter an immigration um, enforcement. We also have information about how to prepare, creating something that I didn't speak about, creating a plan and having a well-defined like, guideline on what to do or if you have children, who would your children stay with in the case that um, um, accident or like a deportation happens? Um, who will your credit card go to and things like that. So make sure to check out all the resources that we have. Um, and yeah, contact us with any, any, any questions that you might have. And if you do have any friends or colleagues that missed this webinar, we are recording this and it will be available later today at the Community College League of California's website. Um, and again, this video will be closed captioned for anybody that needs it. Um, and again, around four o'clock today, this webinar will be available um, for everybody. Yeah, and I do want to emphasize around the Immigration Legal Intake Service. If you are from a community college, um, we do ask a question in the beginning uh, around what, what, if you are attending college, which school are you attending to? Uh, we do encourage you all to please answer as truthfully as possible if you're attending one of those colleges that is listed down there. Um, and that's only so that we can follow up with you all um, if you're from those campuses. All right, so it looks like we still don't have, we don't have any questions coming in. Um, so then we will just go ahead and just finish this webinar, but, you know, thanks again, everyone for attending and we wish you well.